Um, hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our webinar on happy related disparities in priority populations. My name is Camille Mandaros and I am the program manager for Appeals Aspire Network and I will be your moderator for this webinar. Um, we are conducting this webinar in collaboration with NatPIN. Um, you'll be hearing from NatPIN in a little bit, but before that I'd like to go over some housekeeping items and reminders. So here are our learning objectives for the webinar. You'll hear from Kate Moraras and Pharma Penne talk about happy related health disparities in Asian American and Pacific Islander, or AAPI for short, as well as um, African American populations. They'll also discuss risk factors for HEP B and HEP B as it relates to liver cancer. And then you'll learn about existing resources and campaigns for HEP B prevention and advocacy. And then our third uh, third panelist, Dr. Richard Andrews, will talk about his learned experiences from treating happy patients from diverse populations. Our intended audience for this webinar are really all entities interested in happy prevention in AAPI and African African American populations, which would include advocating for policies that create happy awareness and prevention. And this webinar is also intended for healthcare providers and staff from clinical and non-clinical settings who are interested in increasing Hep B screening and prevention in priority populations. And here are just some housekeeping reminders. Um, we're recording this webinar and it will be up on the Appeal and NAPIN's web websites later so you'll have the ability to share it with anyone. Um, the audience is muted, but you'll be able to ask questions through through the chat box, and um, I have my colleague Allison here with me who will um, help me keep track and monitor the chat box. Uh, this webinar is scheduled for an hour and 15 minutes. We're very lucky um, to have three panelists who are experts in the topic of HEP B. Uh, we will have a brief Q&A after each panelist is done presenting, and we'll also have a collective Q&A at the end. And then I'd also like to acknowledge our funder, the CDC, Office on Smoking and Health, and the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control for making our work as a national network possible. Um, now I'd like to turn over the mic to Michael Scott to give a brief overview of NatPIN. Uh, Michael, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and... Can you guys see that? It well, stopped sharing, but we were able to see it for a little bit. Okay. Let me try this one more time. Okay, here we go. So, and Perfect. <laughs> Okay, I have like five screens open, so I gotta make sure you guys are seeing the right one. <laughs> <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to thank Camille for um, inviting Napton to participate um, on this webinar. And just wanna give the participants a brief overview of Napton, who we are and what we do. Uh, along with Camille and the Appeal Network, uh, we're also funded by the CDC to do work around cancer and tobacco prevention. Um, in our specific community, which is African Americans. Um, what I would like folks to really um, take away from um, this, uh, as far as NAPTIN is concerned, is our focus on health disparities. I think this topic is very important and very timely um, for our upcoming conference, our State of Black Health Conference being held September 1st to 3rd in Charlotte, North Carolina. Our focuses this year are going to be cancer, gun violence, and mental health. So the folks on, um, on this webinar, I think um, cancer, the focus on cancer, the relationship between hepatitis B and liver cancer uh, is something that we, <clears throat> excuse me, that we haven't focused on at the State of Black Health. So um, if you can see on the, on the webpage here, our registration um, will be open, I believe today, if not today, very soon. Um, 
we have three tracks for our conference, institutional injustices, economic barriers, and wellness and chronic disease disparities. So the folks on this webinar uh, would fall into the chronic disease disparities track. Um, so if there's interest in the conference, um, please take down that website and um, feel free to register. Uh, early bird registration lasts until March 2nd. Um, and again, our, our focus is our uh, this year, cancer, gun violence, mental health, and then just uh, a myriad of other public health issues that are critical to the African American population. Um, and I can give folks, I'll put my contact information in the chat box. If folks have any questions, um, feel free to, to reach out. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Michael. The State of Black House, Con um, Black House Conference should be very exciting next year. Um, and then uh, I'd like to also uh, do a brief overview of Appeal and the Aspire Network. Um, let's see, I'll share my PowerPoint. Okay. All right, so um, Appeal, which stands for the Asian Pacific Partners for Empowerment, Advocacy and Leadership, is the parent organization of the Aspire Network. Um, Appeal is a national nonprofit uh, providing leadership and advocacy on health justice issues related to tobacco, healthy eating, active living, and cancer in the Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, or AANHPI for short. Um, our mission is to champion social justice and achieve health equity and empowerment for AA and HBI populations by supporting and mobilizing community-led movements through advocacy and leadership development on critical public health issues. So Appeal implements the Aspire Network. Um, like NAPIN, the Aspire Network is one of the eight CDC-funded national networks working to prevent commercial tobacco use as well as eliminate cancer-related disparities in priority populations, and Aspire focuses on serving AA and HBI populations. And the overall goal for Aspire as a national network is to really build community capacity and develop policy initiatives to address tobacco and cancer disparities in AA and HBI populations. Um, here are, are, is our network map. Um, we have seven network partners currently across the 50 states and the Pacific jurisdictions. Uh, Appeal works with these organizations to implement some of the ASPIRE activities under our CDC grant. As Appeal implements uh, the ASPIRE network, it also leads most of the activities under our scope of work. Some of these activities are shown here um, on the slide. It's really through the third activity listed here, providing tobacco and technical assistance and training to Aspire Network member, members and other entities who work with AA and HPI populations that Aspire and NAPIN are conducting this happy webinar as it relates to disparities, including liver cancer and priority populations. So thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce our first um, panelist, Kate Moara. Kate is the Deputy Director of Public Health at the Hepatitis B Foundation and the director of Happy United, a national coalition dedicated to reducing the health disparities associated with Hep B. Kate manages strategic planning, capacity building, training, technical assistance, and grant programs for Hep B United. For over 15 years, Kate has developed and implemented national policies and programs dedicated to addressing racial and ethnic disparities in health, with a focus on supporting community-based organizations working to increase access to care for medically underserved communities. All right, Kate, the mic is yours. Great. Thank you, Camille. Um, so I'm just going to pull up my PowerPoint. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Um, first, I'd like to thank Camille, Akil, um, Michael, and the uh, Net PIN Networks uh, for inviting us uh, to share more about hepatitis B health disparities and also for organizing this webinar. Um, I'm with the Hepatitis B Foundation, as Camille mentioned. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is focus on eliminating hepatitis B in the Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. Uh, um, and the presentation today will focus on um, 
a quick overview about hepatitis B, um, the disparities focusing on the Asian American Pacific Islander populations, um, hepatitis B and liver cancer disparities, and then we'll go into a little bit about um, some of the barriers in screening and treatment in the U.S., um, along with uh, including stigma and discrimination and campaigns and resources that are working to address those barriers. So start off with the ABCs of viral hepatitis, and this is often because there's often a lot of confusion about the different hepatitis viruses, especially if you don't work in um, the hepatitis world. So I wanted to start off with a quick overview of the three viruses that are prevalent in the United States, um, and that's hepatitis A, B, and C. All three are viruses that attack and damage the liver. Uh, so hepatitis A um, is transmitted from person to person through the fecal oral route or through consumption of contaminated food and water. So you usually hear about hepatitis A outbreaks in like the restaurant industry linked to imported food. Uh, but most recently um, in 2017, hep A outbreaks uh, in the, uh, began occurring among persons who use drugs and persons experiencing homelessness. Hep A is an acute infection, so it usually resolves within two months. Um, so the best way to prevent Hep A is to get vaccinated. And Hep B and C are more similar. Um, both viruses are transmitted through direct contact with infected blood or body fluids. Um, unfortunately, they can both develop into chronic or lifelong infections. So both viruses can be transmitted through sexual contact, sharing needles, syringes, or other drug injection equipment, or from mother to baby during birth. Um, the main difference between the two viruses here is breakthroughs around prevention and treatment options. Hepatitis B is preventable, like hepatitis A, through vaccination. Hepatitis C does not have a vaccine, but if infected, there are now, um, good news is there are now short-term treatments that can actually cure chronic hepatitis B. For those chronically infected with hepatitis B, there are highly effective treatment options available. Um, so if you're chronically infected, you can live a very long and healthy life. Um, so before I move on, I also wanna, it's important to also note that there are other, uh, there's also hepatitis D or Delta virus uh, to be aware of that can severely uh, damage the liver, infect the liver. And um, one important thing to note is that only those already infected with hepatitis B can acquire hepatitis Delta. So what is the hepatitis B virus? Um, hepatitis B is a liver infection. Um, and this virus, um, and there's a photo of the virus in the lower left uh, quadrant there. The virus can be transmitted, as I mentioned, from an infected mother to her baby at birth um, through exposure to infected blood, um, protected sex, sharing needles, syringes, or other drug injection equipment. The most common route of transmission uh, globally and within the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is through perinatal or mother to child transmission. Um, hepatitis B, it's important to know that it can be an acute infection. This is usually the case if someone is infected as an adult. Most adults are able to fight off a hep B infection and clear the virus from their body, blood within six months. However, approximately 10% of healthy adults 30 to 50% of children, and important to note, 90% of babies will not be able to get rid of the virus and will develop a chronic uh, or lifelong hep B infection. So it's really important um, to intervene, uh, especially if you know a mother who uh, is infected with hep B. Um, worldwide, um, an estimated 292 million people live with chronic hep B infection. In the U.S., it's an estimated up to 2.2 million uh, living with chronic hep B infection. Uh, hep B is known as a silent infection or a silent killer. Uh, hepatitis B, because there are no warning signs often, there are often no symptoms. Um, and a majority of people do not know they are infected. So, uh, that means that without a diagnosis, left untreated, one in four chronically infected with hep B will develop liver failure or liver cancer. But it's not all doom and gloom. The best news is that there is a safe and effective vaccine, as I mentioned before, against hepatitis B that offers lifelong protection. Um, in the U.S., all newborns are recommended to begin vaccination for hep B at birth. 
uh, prior to hospital discharge. There is a prophylaxis uh, also to be given if the mother has hep B along with the vaccine that can prevent uh, the transmission during birth. And then for adults, it's never too late to start the hep B vaccine. If you're tested, you test negative and you're not immune, um, adults can get a two or three dose vaccine. Um, unfortunately, in the US, the rates of vaccination among adults is very low at only 25%. So there's a lot of work to do amongst adult vaccination as well. So moving on to hep B related health disparities. Um, so chronic hep B and liver cancer, um, it, hep B is the single greatest health disparity for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So of the 2.2 million estimated living with chronic hep B in the United States, more than half are from API communities. Um, and why is that? Um, hep B is endemic um, in Asia. So first generation Asian Americans from Asia and from Pacific Islands are particularly at high risk um, due to uh, situations like low infant immunization rates in, in countries. So most Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who have hep B contracted it during childbirth from their mothers. Um, and that's why it's common to see multiple members of the same family affected by hepatitis B. So in fact, um, because of the high rates of hep B, um, Asian Americans are nearly three times more likely to develop liver cancer compared to Caucasians. Um, and I wanted to highlight a, that a new surveillance data that came out of, from CDC just a month and a half ago. Um, the latest data for, is from 2017 that shows a major disparity amongst Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders uh, who currently have the highest hep related mortality rates, 5.3 times higher. Um, this is a rate that increased between 2015 and 2017. So talking about liver cancer in the U.S., um, the most common risk factor for liver cancer um, is chronic infection with the hep B virus. Um, individuals chronically infected with hep B have a 25 to 40% lifetime risk of developing liver cancer. Um, other risk factors for liver cancer include cirrhosis, alcohol use, smoking, as well as obesity, obesity and diabetes. In the US, liver cancer is actually the only um, cancer that is increasing in incidence and mortality. Uh, it's the second deadliest cancer, um, and the five-year survival rate is about 17.6%. And it's important to note that um, incidence is underrated. Many um, hep, uh, primary liver cancer-related deaths are not identified as primary liver cancer or are miscoded. And looking at liver cancer disparities, um, you'll see here that data shows that Asian American Pacific Islander men are six to three times higher than Caucasian men, um, 13 times higher in Vietnamese men, eight times higher in Korean men, and six times higher in Chinese men. And for those that are working with the Aspire and NAPPIN networks, um, you might be interested to know about the related risk factors of smoking um, and hepatitis B. Um, a recent study showed that um, by Dr. Moon Chen and all um, looked at several risk factors uh, for uh, hepatitis B. Um, and it showed that um, Vietnamese men had the highest lifestyle pattern prevalence, and lifestyle includes being a current smoker or an alcohol user. Um, and they're also most likely to have uh, both the risk factors of the lifestyle and the viral infection of hepatitis B or hepatitis C. So it's really important that programs that focus, need to focus and emphasize smoking prevention and cessation um, and hepatitis B management, um, especially amongst Asian American men are critically important, an opportunity for collaborative um, interventions there. Um, and wanted to note two other uh, recent studies, um, one from China that looked at cigarette smoking um, in male patients, um, they found that uh, for those patients who were infected with a chronic hepatitis B, um, smoking actually worsens liver disease um, and delays improvement in uh, fibrosis or liver scarring. 
uh, while undergoing hepatitis B treatment. And then another analysis uh, that uh, we found looked at uh, the risk of, uh, that saw that the risk of um, liver cancer was highest among uh, hepatitis B positive, positive smokers, followed by uh, hepatitis B positive non-smokers and was lowest in hepatitis B negative smokers. So moving on to um, look at barriers, um, what's happening in terms of prevention and treatment in the US. Uh, so the main issue here is that very people are aware about hepatitis B. There is a very uh, lack of education about hepatitis B and very little people are screened. Um, and as I mentioned, a majority are unaware of their infection. Um, and among those diagnosed, less than half can access sustainable health care or uh, receive uh, assistant treatment. Um, hepatitis B screening is not routinely, not routinely conducted, unfortunately, amongst most healthcare systems in the US. Um, and that can be due to low provider awareness um, and awareness of those at risk for hepatitis B infection. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, and as I mentioned before, in terms of prevention in the US, only a quarter of adults are currently vaccinated against hepatitis B. Um, and there are a lot of uh, systemic challenges to, to accessing the hepatitis B vaccine as well. And this Hep B Care Cascade kind of shows you uh, what I just mentioned, uh, that only uh, 30, 35% of infected Americans are diagnosed and less than 10% of all infected Americans are accessing treatment. So um, this shows that there are barriers to HEPI screening and care um, at all levels, um, from society to individual. Um, and this can be due to uh, discrimination in the system. Um, we, and we'll share a little bit about that later, about experience of the stigma and discrimination um, with people who are living with hepatitis B. Um, and that they can be experiencing this from where they immigrated from. For example, China has a lot of discriminatory laws, um, but so does the US. Um, and then there are also at different levels in the community to the interpersonal um, barriers that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, immigrant refugee communities experience in general in accessing healthcare uh, from lack of uh, limited English proficiency, um, lack of health insurance or under insurance, um, not going to the doctor unless you uh, are not feeling well, um, and um, fear of change in immigration status. Um, something that, uh, particularly right now, there's a lot of concern within the Asian American Pacific Islander communities. And then looking at um, physician-related barriers as well. Um, so as I mentioned, there are also a lack of knowledge about hepatitis B sometimes um, amongst many healthcare providers. Um, so the testing is not routine, or there is a fear of uh, not being able to manage chronic HIV patients. Um, and I know Dr. Dr. Andrews will talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation. So I wanted to cover a little bit about um, combating um, HPV-related discrimination. Um, hepatitis B is a protected condition under, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and also uh, protected within Section 57 of the Non-Discrimination Provision of the Affordable Care Act. Um, we at the Hepatitis B Foundation um, have a helpline and we often receive phone calls from those that have been recent di recently diagnosed or family members or people experiencing discrimination. Um, one of the most prevalent issues has to do with employment-related discrimination. Those that work in the healthcare industry and those that are serving the country in the military. Um, and these are two specific case studies that we've encountered um, that I want to highlight. Within medical, dental, and other healthcare-related school policies, 
uh, for example, a student would lose hepatitis B, applies to med medical school, and comes across admissions policy asking for proof of immunity for enrollment or stating or reading a statement that says that their admission could be revoked if they test positive for the infection. Um, this is illegal as it, as it is protected under the ADA. Um, it can be intimidating for students. So we're working to address those issues and make sure that healthcare related schools um, are aware of the policy and um, change them so that people living with hepatitis B um, don't encounter these intimidated policies. And then in the military, um, service members living with hep B faces a medical evaluation board limited deployment status or is threatened from the threatened to be discharged after serving in the army for 14 years, including three tours. Um, this is an example of um, an instance that this has happened. Um, and this is due to the fact that the Department of Defense does not have consistent policies for service members living with hepatitis B and sort of this up to their discretion on how they are treating uh, service members. And so moving on to resources um, and ways that and organizations as well as campaigns that are working to address things like discrimination and prevention and treatment barriers. Um, wanted to share a few uh, helpful resources. So as I mentioned, um, we at the Hepatitis B Foundation uh, has, we have been a resource for, for patients with Hep B looking for information on a support network. Um, and it was founded um, based on the situation of our founder who was looking for HEPI information. Um, we're the only national organization focused on HEPI, and we're dedicated to finding a cure and improving the quality of life for those affected worldwide. Um, the HEPI Foundation has several programs, including outreach and education. Um, so we're a primary source of information, as I mentioned. We have a, a helpline um, that includes a phone call phone line as well as email um, where patients or caretakers can reach out to us with any any questions related to hepatitis B. Um, and we receive about 10,000 consults a year via telephone, email, and direct social me media messages. Our public health research team conducts uh, research in partnership with local uh, academic research centers and local organizations. Um, we have a national advocacy program um, that aims to increase funding at the federal level for research to find a cure and prevention. Um, and then we also have a biotechnology center that is part of our headquarters in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Um, and you can see a photo of it there. Um, it's an incubator for smaller research companies working on hepatitis, liver diseases, and other conditions. So a fun factoid, uh, the company that founded the hepatitis C cure was actually housed in the biotech center. Um, and then we also finally wanted to mention that we also have a research institute um, that is working on improving biomedical research, drug discovery, discovery early detection methods for um, liver cancer, and also a scientific training and master's level education program at the Bloomberg Institute. And part of our national effort um, to uh, work on hepatitis B and as part of our public health team is forming this national coalition called HEPI United. Um, HEPI United was founded in 2011 as a, a coalition to bring together community-based organizations around the country working on HEPI testing and education. So HBU serves as a network to share resources and build capacity to increase prevention activities and promote access to care. There are currently over 40 uh, national coalitions nationwide um, in about 20 states and Washington, D.C. The goals of HBU are around awareness, prevention, and intervention. Uh, starting with a focus on Asian American Pacific Islanders, but working um, to serve all communities at risk for infection. And this is just a quick look at, uh, we did a survey in 2017 of our coalition partners asking uh, which communities that I currently serve and which communities they've done hepatitis B testing in. So you can see here the diversity of Asian American and Pacific Islander populations that are served by HEP United um, immigrant and refugee communities in the US here. And uh, the coalitions um, are located in these states um, and they serve as a resource for um, 
anyone looking for Hep B information, whether you want to get tested or trying to access treatment for Hep B or liver cancer, um, there are they're working in these states. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to connect you with many of our partners. Um, and then finally, I wanted to mention our um, partnership with the CDC um, through Happy United. Uh, we have been working on a capacity building program. Um, so Happy United provides many grants to support uh, increases in Happy Education and Testing Initiatives, a monthly webinar program based on the needs of coalition members and to disseminate the latest public health research, uh, ongoing individual training and technical assistance, monthly coalition calls, a peer mentoring program that uh, grows new coalition in, uh, in new states, um, an annual summit that brings together face-to-face uh, -face every year to focus on coalition building and sharing resources. And uh, finally, um, we also partner with the CDC to disseminate the No Hepatitis B campaign. Um, and this campaign is a multilingual, um, national campaign um, developed by CDC and HEP United. It was launched in 2013 uh, with four phases so far. Um, the campaign aims to increase testing for chronic HEP B among Asian Americans. Um, the materials are primarily in Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and English. However, there are a suite of materials that are available in additional Asian uh, and African languages. And our campaign resources include materials developed to encourage testing for HEP B, um, but they can also be modified for local communities and events. Um, and the campaign website is cdc.gov slash no hepatitis B. And this is a, a quick uh, look at the suite of materials that are available from the campaign. Um, so posters, infographics, flyers, quizzes, um, television PSAs, radio PSAs, uh, fact sheets. Uh, la last resource I want to mention um, is the Just B campaign. Um, and this was developed by the Hepatitis B Foundation. Uh, it is a national multilingual digital campaign to raise awareness about Hep B to combat stigma through personal storytelling. Um, Just B's goals are to increase awareness and advocacy around Hep B, decrease stigma and discrimination, promote testing, vaccination, linkage to care treatment, and empower people living with hepatitis B to share their stories, to increase public awareness, and inspire action. Uh, we partnered with Story Center, a nonprofit organization based in Berkeley, California, uh, that pioneered the art of digital storytelling workshops. Uh, these workshops bring together eight to 10 storytellers in a three-day workshop that begins with story sharing circles, script writing and ends with the development of individual three-minute videos and those photos are from the story of the storytellers um, and are included included in um, the suite of materials that are available through just be and this just shows the campaign progress so far um, there's been five workshops since 2017 with 36 participants uh, people with either people living with hepatitis C and uh, or family members and there's um, these digital stories include uh, 18 that have been translated in Asian Pacific Island and African languages um, and they can all be viewed at hepi.org slash just um, and it's important to know that storytellers continue to participate in um, HBF and HBU programs including share their, sharing their stories at local education and testing events and participating in hepatitis B advocacy as well. And we're currently conducting an evaluation of the campaign of the impact on both the storytellers themselves and their experience participating in the campaign, as well as the impact of the videos on audience. Um, I don't have time to show a video today, but I do encourage you to visit um, hepi.org slash just and view all of those videos. Um, that those uh, images are from our workshops and photos of all of our storytellers. I wanted to end with one of our storytellers from our first workshop, Alan, um, thought that uh, a quote from his video that really resonated with me and um, kind of captures the experiences of Asian Americans and hepatitis B related health disparities. Uh, so he said, we were left to connect the dots 
because the medical profession is failing to address an epidemic that kills more than 700,000 people a year. It's also ignored by Asian cultures that consider talk about deadly diseases a taboo. Sometimes I wonder if hepatitis B is being ignored here in the US just because it impacts so many Asians, especially given the country's history of discrimination toward immigrants. And there is my contact information as well as um, the HBF helpline to share with your network. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Kate. Um, I know I've seen uh, some of these happy data before from um, a couple of your previous webinars, but it still kind of shocks me every time I see them, um, especially because API communities are not only affected by happy health-wise, but in discriminatory ways as well. Very unfortunate. Um, I don't think there are any questions from the audience um, as we monitor the chat box. So uh, I, we're kind of um, tight on time right now, so I'm going to hold off some moderator questions until the very end. So right now I'd like to introduce our um, second panelist, Parma Penne. Um, she, is, she works at, in the viral hepatitis hepatitis program at the New York City Health Department as a community coordinator for Hep B and C, and as a community chair for Coalition Against Hepatitis in People of African Origins in New York City. Farmo, whenever you're ready, you can start sharing your presentation. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Sorry for that um, inconvenience room issues over here um but i'm finally in um i am going to connect and share my slide okay can you all see it hello yes we can see okay. it okay great great all right. Hello again. Um, so again, my name is Pharma, and I work. And Pharma, Pharma, mm -hmm. if you yes. can um uh, make it into a presenter view because it's um we're just seeing oh, the yes. outline right now and. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Better. Uh, I guess we can work with no? this. It's better. It's okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm like not used to this. Um. That's okay. Okay. Not sure. Display. Okay, never mind. I'll just <laughs> I'll just keep going. Okay, so um, I'm just going to present on um, Hep in African New Yorkers. Um, so here in New York, we have a lot of prevalence of hepatitis B um, in African communities, mainly because there's a lot of Africans, West Africans, um, living in New York. Um, so um, I mainly work in a viral hepatitis program um, on hepatitis B and C. Um, I work with co-infected patients, moms, um, and I'm also the uh, um, community chair for Chip NYC, which is Coalition Against Hepatitis in People of African Origin. And um, and we um, normally focus on the population and African population to make sure that they are getting the care they need. Um, Okay, so okay, so um, so the hepatitis B rate. So um, in New York City, we have um, a lot of Africans um, um, from 2000 to 2011. The um, percentage of Africans has increased to 39 percent, um, which is about 128,000 um, Africans born. Um, and um, we have a lot more living here, um, but because of people who are undocumented, um, it's really hard, hard to count everyone. Um, so majority of the populations, um, African populations in New York City, mostly Sub-Saharan Africans, um, the majority of language spoken is Yoruba, which is Nigerian, um, Wolof, which is where I'm from, uh, Senegal, and um, and the Fulani, um, also Hausa and Tui. Hausa is also Nigerian and Tui, um, Ghana. Fulani is also spoken in um, Senegal, but also Guinea as well um, in other parts of Africa. 
And um, so um, in addition to that, um, so we have about um, the health department has estimated for um, that the populations living with hepatitis C, you know, New York City is about 30, 230,000 people, um, which is about 2.7% of the population. Um, so we have about 123,869 people diagnosed with chronic hepatitis B infection. Um, each year, there are about 6,000 people um, really reported to the, uh, for hepatitis B infection to the health department uh, since 2009. Um, and we have the higher rates of hepatitis B cases in Brooklyn, Queens, and Manhattan. Um, and so I am going to just discuss the programs, hepatitis programs we have in our viral hepatitis program. Um, so um, the hepatitis B moms, um, it is a program um, that is funded by Gilead Sciences. Um, and um, so before, sorry, before going to that, let me just go ahead by saying that in um, one in five uh, pregnant women we have that is you receive appropriate follow-up um, um, after delivery and uh, half of of providers do not educate women about hepatitis B or refer for specialty care, uh, which we'll discuss more in um, the hepatitis B moms program. Um, and one in four women with hepatitis B have flare-ups after delivery and um, about 100, 1,256 pregnant women are reported with hepatitis B in 2017. So in our newly reported uh, annual, in our newly annual report, um, it, is, it is estimated that 1,094 uh, infants were born to women with hepatitis B, um, and that is 96.4% of the women uh, were born outside of U.S. Um, 3.7% 3, 3 were from Guinea, 3.7% from Ghana, and 23 from Senegal. Hey, Farma. Um, I mm -hmm. think some uh, audience uh, asked if you could speak up a little louder. I think they're yeah. having trouble hearing. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Um, okay, so I'm um, gonna give you a little bit more detail about the hepatitis B months program, um, which is, um, like I said earlier, is funded by Gilead Sciences for two years. So what we do um, is um, we are trying to increase maternal engagement in hepatitis B care. Like I said earlier, um, a lot of providers don't refer uh, patients after delivery, which is um, the area where we talk, where we reach out to mothers after delivery to make sure that they are um, getting hepatitis B care. Um, we provide um, education uh, because some of them are just finding about the hepatitis B during pregnancy and um, they don't know anything much about it. So we educate them and encourage um, their um, household contact to get um, tested and vaccinated as well. Um, so um, it is, we do outreach over the phone. Um, um, so normally it's me, uh, myself and uh, my coworker uh, who is Chinese speaking, I speak French and Wolof, and we also have other interns that works in the program. And um, so, um, so the referrals is, uh, are provided by our um, Bureau of, of, of Immunization. Um, they refer the moms um, during the time they follow with the baby, they refer the moms to us and we provide linkage to care. So um, navigators, um, be, so the, we provide culturally, so the navigators, um, which is like me and uh, my coworkers who is uh, Chinese speaking and the other interns, we provide culturally uh, appropriate and um, uh, language uh, navigation services. Um, we support them to get into care um, and we try to answer any questions. Sometimes we do other things because most of the time when you call them hepatitis B, it's just not their focus. Um, there's a lot of other issues happening, so we provide other services as needed. And uh, so in this program, um, we enroll about 400 and uh, 17 uh, patients, moms, um, and 99% of those uh, patients are foreign born um, and 23% uh, were uninsured um, or have temporary insurance and 5% um, refer date contacts. So it's not always easy when um, 
when you're speaking to, to them and telling them about hepatitis B and just something that is transmitted sexually and uh, from a mother to child, just, you know, having them refer their contact, it's something that's very difficult for a lot of them to just willingly just say, call my partner and, and tell them and make sure that they are um, being screened and um, also vaccinated. So it's a really difficult topic to, you know, address with other um, household contacts. Um, so, 157 uh, uh, participants were non-Asian, um, meaning they did not speak Cantonese or a Mandarin, um, and um, of the from the 417 patients enrolled, and from the 157 patients that um, were enrolled were non-Asians, 83% were. Um, English speaking and 17 were non-English speaking. And from the 17%, 3% were Wolof speaking and 2% were French speaking. Um, so um, I'm going to discuss the Check B program. So in New York City, um, we have the Check B program. So it is um, in 2015, the Check B was implemented in neighborhood with high hepatitis B infection. <clears throat> so, um, so it is um these programs were funded by city councils um to provide hepatitis B cares um to the community. Um so as of 2019 there are twelve community health organizations serving at um at risk populations. Um so um there are hepatitis B programs in each of the five boroughs, um, maybe one or two programs, and depending on who received the funding. Um, so participating health centers and households, um, they provide um, care to the underserved population, including immigrants, low income, and uninsured patients. Um, so the JKB program, um, patient navigation, uh, provides uh, trainings, um, culturally and linguistically and linguistically uh, appropriate uh, to um, support the underserved patients to engage in regular hepatitis B and medical care. And um, so um, in 2018, the Check-A-B program, um, which is funded by City Council, enrolled 1,302 um, infected People, a majority were immigrants from Asian Africa. Um, from July of 2014 to October 2019, they enrolled 329 African born patients. Um, so the um, country, of birth, country of birth of those patients was Senegal, uh, mainly because the um, um, Check a B program that um, is an African community, which is the African Services Committee. Um, the navigator speaks Wolof, and therefore, a lot of the patients that approaches him are Wolof speaking, and um, they um, they also do free screening, um, which is why um, there's these other languages. Um, it is Burkina Faso, Ghana, uh, which is 14%, um, and uh, from these 329 African born patients, um, 43% are Medicaid, have Medicaid, and 36% um, are uninsured. Um, so um, I just wanted to say that um, the African Service Committee is just not the only program involving African patients. There are others in uh, within the five boroughs working with the African population, and that's where these 320 African born um, enrolled patients are from. And um, majority of those patients are male, um, which is 65 percent, and females are 34 percent. Um, and the age of these um, patients enrolled um, is um, from 20 to 29, which is 17 percent, and 30 to 29, 32 percent, and um, 26 percent from age 40 to, uh, to 49. 23% from age 50 to 64, and uh, since five and up, it's only 2% of the population of the uh, patient enrolled. Um, so now we're just going to move on and discuss the um, the coalitions, um, and um, so. Um, the uh, so New York City have the um, have department um, have um, um, Hefri NYC, which is. Um, the, um, we have coalitions, um, have check a, um, sorry, um, 
HUD Free Task Force, and we have um, the HUD B Coalition, the GPNYC, and we have um, other uh, resources that we provide to the community to make sure that people are engaged and aware of um, the HEP B and C um, and, and how we can better improve a linkage to care and uh, eliminate the barriers and stigma. Um, so uh, in New York City, the, so the GPNYC, which is Coalition Against Hepatitis and People of African Origin, um, is a chapter of GPO National, um, and this um, and this includes community health centers, um, FGHC, and hospitals in uh, the GPO members. Um, so we work. Um, so um, you work with a lot of community organizations, um, and um, because. In, in in New York, um, the African consider about four percent of the foreign born population, and many are living here without legal residency. Um, and there's a lack of public health awareness. Um, a lot of people aren't aware of what hepatitis B, um, and um, and it's really and the prevalence is really high in the African population. Um, but people just don't know how to get in care, don't know how to get insurance, just the language barriers. Um, so to serve this population, um, she went NYC like um uh had the coalition and other coalitions we um we come together to um, reduce the, the mobility and mortality associated with hepatitis B and C, um, and we collaborated with over 12 organizations serving the African communities in New York City to help eliminate barriers, increase awareness and prevention, and as well as provide health education. Hey, Pharma, sorry to cut you off, but um, mm -hmm. we're running a little bit uh, over time right now, so if you could okay. have, Speed have like three minutes, that'd be great. Thanks. Yep. No problem. Okay, so um, just a little quickly. So, um, chief analysis. So the goal is to bring um, New York City organizations, the providers, and advocates who are dedicated to any hepatitis B and C in the African communities. Um, our goal is to bring increase awareness, um, eliminate the stigmas, provide support um, the organizations serve the African population, and better um, serving. Um, providing services to them. Um, we provide screenings, education. Um, we also do um, uh, presentations and tablings at the other organizations. Um, and so our object objective is to um, organize, so most of the time we organize um, events um, and um, in collaboration with other partners in New York City to make sure that um, African populations are being reached. Uh, we, d we distribute hepatitis um, resources, we promote um, the Check-Up B patient navigation program, we develop, um, local, uh, we do develop local HEP B and C awareness education campaigns, um, advocate for uh, uh, African Immigrant Health Program, um, SQHC, that's the future goal, and uh, we want to explore the development of liver cancer prevention fund uh, to make sure that those patients who are getting in care but can't afford to pay liver, uh, liver screening out of pocket, we want to, um, in the future, get funding that will support um, and pay for those costs. And um, so, these images, as you can see, those are from the events we did, from meetings, and um, and those are our partners um, coming together and supporting. We support each other through um, whatever health fairs is happening in the community. So um, be there um, with the members to um, screen, to do education, provide resources, make sure that people are aware of what other free resources are available in other uh, in other hospitals and and health centers. Um, so accomplishments, um, we. Um, so in the past, we um, we work with um, community health centers of Zion Island, and they received funding for HEPI outreach, and we did a lot of screening with them. Um, through screening in the past, we went to um, the Nigerian um, as well as um, Liberian community to do screening, and that went really well. Um, now they provide hepatitis patient navigation to those patients that was positive, and um, and um, Went to hospital um, and African Service Committee advocated and received increased funding um, from City Council to support the outreach of patient navigation services. Um, I uh, developed GPNYC card and also the pocket card in order to help uh, the community better understand, um, you know, what hepatitis B is, visualize it so that it's, you know, it captures the attention um, and the um, 
these are and these are the packet cards and this is um and and the voucher which we provide at screening events to let people know that you can go and get free screening um so the packet card just mainly to make sure that pe uh, people see it even if they for those who are little or illiterate or may not be able to have time to read the whole thing um that to see the image that this is a disease that can harm you it can be very dangerous for you if you don't get treated and we have uh, information more details about it and also contacts my contact information is on the card so that way people can reach out if they have any questions or want to get um get into care um so uh, so the happy coalition uh, it is um it was founded in 2009 so they meet quarterly um like chief nyc um we um work with the community organizations so we work with providers advocate um just to make sure that people are um coming together and just um you know, supporting the needs of the community, making sure that awareness is out there and that we are doing something to eliminate all the barriers and stigma um, that comes along with um, hepatitis B. Um, and so the accomplishment for um, HIV coalition has been um, with increased collaboration with the hepatitis B uh, focus organization, support HIV work for, uh, workforce development, increase the number of culturally competent and linguistically diverse pop, uh, di uh, providers and health professionals who provide hepatitis B care according to guidelines. And um, we raise awareness, uh, educate the communities, the communities at risk. Um, so. Um, and um, we have these are the our programs um, that is sorry these are our trainings that is done um, by the New York City Health Department um, just to making sure that um, the needs of the community are being met from providers like people providers who want more education about hepatitis B how to address the um, the population so who are diverse um, how to work with them and um, also we have um, trainings for the for the um, navigators and for the public about hepatitis B and C. And uh, these are our resources. Um, just for so for the happy cards, if anyone is looking for uh, for copies, um, we can print it out and mail it to you. Uh, just email me, and as well as the um, the health department's materials, which are here. Um, and we also have like the um, annual reports uh, for New York City. We can provide that to anyone who um, would like a copy. Please email us, and we will um, we'll send it to you. And um, for if you, these are our communications. Um, you can I reach out to us through these methods of contact, email, websites, or social media. And um, and that's it. Any questions? Sorry that went really quick. Um, it's all good. <laughs> Thanks so much, Thanks Farma. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing your wonderful work at NYC um, and for all the great resources. Um, yeah, I'm sorry we were running a little bit behind. So, and I do want to give Dr. Andrews um, uh, more time to speak. Um, so, without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Andrews, um, who is the co-chair for the National Task Force on. Um, uh, Hep B and Hep C. Um, he, uh, I'm sorry, I, I lost my place here. The National Task Force on Hep B and has been working at Hope Clinic in Houston, Texas for the last um, 11 years. He has a special um, interest in treating patients with Hep B and Hep C in culturally and linguistically diverse populations. Um, all right, Dr. Andrews, um, let me, let's just, uh, let me just load your uh, presentation and then uh, you're ready to go. Okay. Your screen so we can have um, Dr. Andrews. What do I need to do? Oh, I'm just asking Pharma to stop sharing her screen. Oh, so I'm so sorry. Sorry to Dr. Share. Andrew for taking so much of your time. <laughs> All right. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, my name is uh, Richard Andrews, as she said. I want to thank the uh, organizers and the previous uh, panelists uh, and the funders, uh, and uh, I appreciate being asked uh, to be one of the presenters here. Um, I wear uh, two hats in this case. Uh, as indicated, I'm the co-chair of the National Task Force on Hep B. Uh, the National Task Force on Hep B is an organization 
that is focused uh, primarily on helping clinicians uh, learn more about how to deal with um, Hep B. Uh, it's sort of the clinical arm of some of these other efforts. Uh, and um, it was historically focused on the Asian and Pacific Islander community, and that continues to be a big focus. But we enjoy working with uh, uh, anybody who's interested in Hep B, uh, because of course there are, uh, although we know that 50% or more of the Hep B cases, chronic Hep B cases in the U.S. are Asian. That means that nearly 50% are not, and so we have to work with everybody in order to uh, to make uh, to achieve some success. Uh, next slide. Uh, my, the other hat that I wear is um, I work as a family doctor at uh, Hope Clinic in uh, Houston. Uh, it's in uh, the uh, Asia Town section of Houston, um, and Hope Clinic uh, is an FQHC, a uh, community health center that was started uh, uh, nearly 20 years ago uh, by the Asian community, uh, and it. Uh, hired me a number of years ago uh, and at the time I was the only doctor uh, and now we have around 20 or so um, and uh, at the time again because the target audience for Hope Clinic at the time was uh, the Asian community um, because the Asian community started it uh, they indicated um, that one of the interests of the community uh, and of the founders was to make sure that we helped people with this disparity of hepatitis B and to a lesser extent, hepatitis C in the Asian community. Uh, now from the outset, especially when we became a, a community health center and an FQHC, we see anybody who comes in the door, whether they are Asian or not, of course, uh, and we screen um, extensively for uh, hepatitis B. Uh, I, you know, sometimes, uh, when screening for Hep B, as we've heard from some of the earlier uh, presentations, um, sometimes we use what's called risk-based screening. Uh, at Hope Clinic, I tell people that we have a broader uh, approach to screening in which if you have a pulse, then we screen, basically. In other words, if you're in the building, you're likely to get screened uh, if, you're, if, if you are willing to give up a little bit of your blood. Uh, and so, because we have an at-risk population, it's a mostly foreign-born population, uh, uh, mostly um, foreign language speaking population, and uh, roughly, uh, I would say roughly 40% of our patients are uh, Asians, roughly 40% are Hispanic, and then the other 20% are from uh, all over the world, really. Um, and uh, when I first started working there myself about 11 years ago, uh, I didn't know anything um, or, or no more than you learn in uh, medical school, really. I, I had never treated Hep B myself, uh, but my boss said, uh, well, we got to start uh, treating uh, hepatitis B in-house and uh, for, for two reasons, I would say. One being that even if, uh, even if doctors or mid-level providers uh, diagnose uh, Hep B in somebody, if we refer them to a specialist, uh, some patients uh, don't go to the specialist, either because they refuse to or because they uh, can't afford it, which is very common. Uh, specialists uh, tend to be expensive. Uh, and um, so we, we thought that by seeing them in-house, uh, seeing you know, identifying uncomplicated cases of Hep B, which is the majority, uh, we could start treating it in-house. So basically, I went to a lot of lectures by hepatologists and, and infectious disease doctors and discovered that it was really not uh, as complicated as it might appear. Um, sometimes uh, clinicians, primary care clinicians, are sometimes reluctant to start treating Hep B because they imagine it's similar to HIV in its complexity, but that's not true. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, I'll say a little bit more later about uh, something that will be uh, published soon that should, uh, should make it even easier to take care of uh, most chronic hepatitis B cases uh, in primary care. Uh, next slide. So for about uh, nine or 10 years now, we've been seeing um, chronic hepatitis B patients at Hope Clinic. Uh, 
As far as the number of patients that have ever come through Hope Clinic and been diagnosed with hepatitis B, the number is probably now between six and 700. Um, now, those patients are not all under active care. Of course, some patients come one time and they never come back. Maybe they've moved out of the area or they have another provider or what have you. But we are uh, actively managing, uh, I would say, uh, 300 or so uh, chronic hepatitis B patients at any given time, between three and 400. <laughs> and um, we also see hepatitis C patients. Uh, I'm referring mostly to adult patients. I see an occasional child, although I prefer to have uh, uh, pediatric uh, doctors uh, see them. Um, so I'm dealing mostly with adult patients, um, and 80% uh, of the patients with hepatitis that I see, uh, or excuse me, 80% of the patients that I see currently uh, have uh, viral hepatitis, and most of those are hepatitis B. Uh, they're occasionally co-infected with hepatitis B and hepatitis C. The particular patients that we see uh, uh, occasionally have HIV, uh, but not very many in our particular populations. As far as the countries of origin, uh, the patients are largely from uh, Vietnam, China, uh, West African countries, particularly Nigeria, uh, Myanmar, uh, which used to be called Burma, and then uh, a variety of other countries. We also have some uh, uh, native-born uh, Anglo and African-American patients, um, and uh, some of the patients, for example, uh, that have acquired um, Hep B or Hep C um, uh, domestically, that is to say in the US. Uh, in some cases, that's because of uh, uh, a past history, hopefully a past history of unsafe uh, drug use. Um, and of course, hepatitis B can also be uh, sexually transmitted. A lot of people don't realize that hepatitis B is considered one of the sexually transmitted diseases. And although hepatitis C can be transmitted sexually, it's not very common. Um, we have a, as far as payer mix, uh, we have a mixture of uh, uninsured patients, underinsured patients, and, uh, in, and patients with decent insurance. Um, I wish we could say we had more patients with decent insurance, but as we all know, that's not, not as common as it should be, especially in uh, patients with uh, health disparities. Um, next slide. Um, and uh, some of the challenges we face, well, um, hepatitis B is interesting uh, when you compare it with, let's say, uh, hepatitis C or HIV in that, and this sometimes puzzles people when they first hear about it, um, including patients. Um, most patients with uh, hepat chronic hepatitis B, most adults, that is, will end up on an antiviral medication at some point, uh, but not all of them. Um, uh, now, occasionally, it's because the patient refuses to take the medicine, but uh, even where they uh, are, are willing to take it, uh, you know, we have various mechanisms for determining uh, which patients are at greater risk of developing some of the consequences of chronic hepatitis B, for example, uh, liver cancer and cirrhosis, uh, and we're able to uh, uh, triage those patients and determine which patients are at low risk. Um, and this is just based on the science. For example, in general, female patients have less risk than males. Um, uh, younger patients have less risk than older patients, uh, things like that. So, uh, and Asian, uh, Asian and African patients tend to have higher risk, uh, and, um, and even African-American patients have somewhat higher risk, although not nearly as high as African patients uh, or Asian patients. So uh, most patients end up on antiviral medicine, but because uh, with hepatitis uh, C, you can, you can you know, give the patient medicine for two to three months and most patients will then be cured. With hepatitis uh, B, it's a very different uh, calculation um, because these are patients who will stay on the medication for uh, many years at a time because if you put them on it and then take the, me take the medicine away, then they get a flare uh, and um, you're not necessarily helping the patient in that case. So, uh, you know, telling a 25-year-old patient, let's say, to take medicine for the next umpteen years is a different thing than telling somebody to take a medicine for two or three months. 
and so we try to identify patients at greater risk, and then uh, uh, they're the ones that go on on uh, treatment. Um, now, because of the work being done at the Hepatitis B Foundation and elsewhere, um, hopefully there will be a future cure for hepatitis B. Um, we have great medicines, uh, as was mentioned earlier uh, uh, in Kate's uh, presentation. We have great medications, but they're good at reducing the load of the virus, the, the viral level. Um, we, are, we do not yet have medicines, really, that, uh, that consistently can cure hepatitis B. Um, at some point, uh, I tell patients that if you take it for 10 years, by then maybe we'll have uh, a medicine. Um, and uh, so uh, many of these patients uh, speak little or no English. Um, and so we, um, we, have, uh, we try to hire staff that speak more than one language. Uh, and we try to hire staff from the communities that we serve. Um, so that uh, we often have uh, native speakers in-house for a particular language. Um, but, you know, if we have, since we have, we, we have had as many as 80 different languages pass through Hope Clinic over the years. Uh, and so, um, you know, obviously we can't have people speaking every language natively, um, but we have uh, telephone translation. And that's obviously important when you're serving uh, these patients is that you have access to the, to the translation. Um, and there are various cultural and religious factors. Uh, you know, uh, for example, among women from uh, Myanmar, um, formerly uh, uh, um, Burma, it's much more common for some of these uh, adult women to uh, chew tobacco, for example, than other populations. Um, and it's just part of the culture. Sometimes the tobacco is mixed with uh, uh, betel nut or betel leaf, um, and uh, sometimes it's uh, the betel by itself, uh, a plant product, and um, sometimes it's the combination. And, um, and then with some, of, some patients, uh, because of their religion, uh, will refuse to initially either accept the diagnosis, even with overwhelming uh, evidence that they have chronic hepatitis B, uh, and uh, or at other times they will acknowledge the diagnosis, but they uh, may refuse to take medication in some cases. And so what I try to do in a case like that is simply uh, advise them appropriately um, and and establish uh, a connection, a rapport with the patient. You know, bring them back periodically, uh, and then uh, I would say in most cases that uh, at some point they acknowledge that maybe taking medicine wouldn't be such a bad idea. Uh, next slide. Hi, Dr. Andrews. Um, if I can ask you to wrap it up, um, I'll like, give oh. a uh, two or three minutes um, so we can have uh, time for Q&A. Thank you. Very good, yeah. So here's some of the things that I would recommend for uh, clinics uh, and clinicians considering uh, working with some of these patients. Uh, the cost of medications is a concern, but actually if they're uninsured, it's actually easy to get medicine through the patient assistance programs. Um, Consider working with a specialty pharmacy because they're good at doing the paperwork and, and making you guys do less paperwork for getting medications, whether they're insured or uninsured. Um, and, um, you know, the labs can be expensive, but, um, but uh, this is for uninsured patients. Sometimes a local hospital or a local lab will donate uh, a certain number of lab services to you. That's how we've been able to take care of so many people. And you want some providers locally um, to uh, become champions and develop expertise. It's really not as hard as you imagine. There's really only two medicines that we use. Um, and if one of them doesn't work, you go to the other one. Uh, and the, um, the hepatitis B task force will, uh, either by the end of this year or short or early in 2020, be putting out, uh, and the Hepatitis B Foundation will help, and other, and Hep B United will help with getting this guideline to simplify Hep B care in the primary care setting uh, getting that uh, that uh, guidance out. Uh, next slide. Um, fatty, fatty liver disease is a big issue, as we know. Uh, it's spreading rapidly overseas as well as locally. Uh, and a uh, certain number of patients with fatty liver disease will develop inflammation of the same kind that is caused by hepatitis. And if a person has both of those, then that further increases or further can increase their risk of developing cirrhosis and liver cancer. Uh, I sometimes tell my uh, 
my patients from overseas are welcome to America, but be careful about them. When you come to America, there's a big tendency to gain weight and you have to guard against that. Uh, okay, next slide. Uh, this is a little complex, but this just basically talks about some of the different factors, including betel nut and aflatoxin B, which is found in, in many African diets and some other diets around the world. These are things that can also increase the risk of liver cancer in some of these overseas populations. So you want to uh, learn about that and be careful and, and advise your patients accordingly. Next slide. Uh, this is a slide, uh, again, I'll just summarize it. Basically, people with chronic liver disease, uh, including patients with chronic hepatitis B, have uh, barriers to care, I mean, proven barriers to care with overall less income, overall more likely to have public health insurance rather than private health insurance, and higher prevalence of having barriers to care than patients with uh, other chronic diseases. Next slide. And that's it. Those are my references, uh, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrews. Um, this is 11.15. I know we only scheduled this webinar until 11.15 um, uh, Pacific time. Um, so if, he, if people need to go from the audience, we understand, um, but we would just like to answer um, some questions from um, the audience in the chat box before we log off. And I have like a, a couple of moderator questions to wrap it up. Um, so someone from the audience, um, I'm assuming this is for Kate and Pharma, um, their question is, what has your experience been so far in working with faith-based communities? And is this hard to, uh, is this a, a population that is hard to reach? Um, this is Kate, I can start. Um, We've had really great success, actually, with working with faith-based communities um, in both the Asian American as well as um, our partners through Happy United that work with the African communities. Um, in fact, um, one of the first toolkits on how to conduct a hepatitis C screening was developed with working with Korean American churches. So um, that is from the Hepatitis C Initiative of Washington, D.C. Um, that's how they started working and finding um, Asian Americans to uh, test for hepatitis B. Um, so I think the issue there is just gaining the trust of the pastor or the, um, the gatekeeper within the faith-based organizations, and they've been very receptive. And we're starting one of our mini, current mini grants actually in New York, in the New Jersey and New York City area, are currently working with faith-based leaders in the Asian American community to do hepatitis B education. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Kate. And just to wrap it up, I have um, a question for all the panelists. Um, so we heard um, from Kate and Pharma, uh, you know, uh, three different populations that have been disproportionately affected with Hep B, and it's Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and uh, um, African Americans. So for the Asian American and Pacific Islander population, Hep B has been around for decades now, but um, for uh, African-born immigrants, this is something that's relatively new to their community. So are there any lessons learned from all these years that can help um, a newer community to, um, you know, uh, prevent Hep B and um, to increase advocacy for hepatitis B? Um, so, um, sorry, I'll go since Katie went first. Um, okay, so um, I think the lesson we've learned has been, um, especially in, in um, bringing awareness into the community, just making sure that um, people, um, you know, you're bringing someone who is from the community, someone who is from the same country, someone who speaks the same language, um, and and that way it allows for you know trust um, and and build the relationship and to be able to connect with the rest of the population because even someone like me who's uh, African and I go to um, for example uh, um, a, Ghana a Guinean community um, it, I don't feel as welcome just because I don't speak the language so I don't, it's not you know I don't connect well with them so it's better to have someone who's always who always speaks the language and, um, and in terms of increasing advocacy um, you know just having that those numbers um, just you know uh, people who are um, screened um, and you know that weights of, of, of hepatitis prevalence in African population and being able to connect that with number two um, uh, 
request for funding um, is, you know, is the best way. But just currently, there's just a lot of not that much numbers of um, hepatitis B, um, you know, from like reported numbers of hepatitis B in the African population because a lot of them um, is really hard to reach out to them. So um, I think that's been um, the barriers and a lesson learned. Um, Great, thank you so much, Pharma. And we do have a question from the audience for Dr. Andrews. Dr. Andrews, in your opinion and experiences, do you get the sense that some PCPs are hesitant to treat HBV and HCV in the primary care setting? Is this what, if so, what are those perceived barriers? Um, part of it, of course, has to do with, uh, uh, and this may be the primary one, in fact, is that PCPs uh, usually are experiencing, and I say this as a PCP, experiencing a certain amount of uh, burnout, uh, of stress. And so whenever somebody with a bright idea comes up and says, oh, I know a way that you can do more work, you know, <laughs> then that goes over like a lead balloon. So that, that, may, be, uh, <laughs> that may be one of the things. Uh, but for people um, who uh, are willing to learn, you know, one extra thing, and of course, we have to do continuing education anyway as providers. Uh, and so, uh, especially for people who uh, are uh, passionate about working with uh, populations that have health disparities, uh, which I suspect is most of the people or all the people on this call, uh, then, um, you know, finding out that it's less complicated than you imagine and, uh, and of course, uh, you know, one of the things that the task force, the hepatitis B task force is interested in doing is developing um, uh, provider clinical training uh, through uh, the ECHO program or other video training programs. And uh, that's something that the task force is going to be working on in the next uh, year or two, uh, trying to, uh, you know, help um, organizations develop some local um, uh, televideo training uh, so that uh, primary care providers with less experience uh, can present cases and watch other cases being presented. And that really, um, uh, you know, makes it much easier when people, you know, after, after just a few cases have been presented, you realize that it's less complicated than you imagined. Um, uh, and that was my experience when I first started taking care of Hep B. Uh, and of course, I, I identify um, patients that are not complicated. Uh, and so as soon as I determined that a patient, even with all my experience in primary care hepatitis B care, um, I, uh, as soon as I determined that a patient has certain complications like severe ascites, for example, uh, or even moderate ascites and hepatic encephalopathy and some of these other things, uh, as soon as I determined that somebody has uncompensated cirrhosis or more serious cirrhosis, then I will right away try to get that patient into a, a specialist. I, I don't take care of complicated patients. And so I think, uh, I think those of us in the business here of providing this kind of care and trying to do outreach uh, need to do a better job of, uh, uh, of getting the word out about the fact that it's easier than you think and there are people in your community who need this care. Great question. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrews. Uh, okay, I think that's really all the time we have for today's webinar. Thank you for those who stayed until the very end. Um, I would like to thank our panelists again for sharing their um, expertise on this topic. If people still have questions, please feel free to email me um, the questions and I will reroute them to the panelists. I think you should have my email from the email confirmation um, that you received when you registered from the webinar. Um, and then lastly, please, uh, if you uh, take a few minutes to fill out our survey for the webinar, Zoom will prompt you to, um, to the survey link right after I end this webinar. So uh, thank you again, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.